Good day, sir. Okay, my name is Emmanuel F. Yombasi, and it's a pleasure having you on set. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I believe there's a lot of anticipation, a lot of questions in the air. People want to know, people want to know. And um, this session um, is tagged the man, the message, and the spirit behind the message. So first of all, let's start with the man. Who is Apostle Michael Ropo? Oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> well, as you've already mentioned, my name is Oropo Michael. I'm a husband of one wife and a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. Wow. Beautiful. That's, that's as concise and as brief as, <laughs> as possible. And um, um, we love to know um, the mission, the mission behind what God has committed to you. What's the mission behind what God has committed to you? You know, um, having served in the body of Christ for a couple of years now, I've um, seen a lot of things. I've had a lot of burdens over the years that have been, you know, furnished in my heart by the Holy Spirit. As you grow and draw closer to God in an intimate walk, what it does is that it begins to share the burdens in His heart for you. And so the Lord began to draw me on an intimate journey for a couple of years now, and I've been following through you know, with these burdens, which has characterized my messages and my drive as a person. And um, until earlier this year, when the Lord began to talk to me about, you know, starting a work because of um, what he wants to do and the extent of the liberty of the spirit he wants to have in expression, uh, I struggled with it for a season until the encounters became enormous and I yielded myself to it. It was at that point that the Lord gave me a mandate and a mission and the mission is basically twofold number one is to raise the people that know him experientially and um, this may sound simple but the truth is if you have interacted with people lots of believers today you discover they are confused confused about vital issues of life confused about strategic decisions of destiny confused about their very ordination and meaning of their existence and you find people having these kinds of crises when they don't have an experiential knowledge of God. You see that. So the mission of this ministry, first fold, is to raise the people that know God experientially. And experiential knowledge of God entails a lot of things in scripture. So number one, Jesus said in John 17 verse 3, he said, this is life eternal, that you may know him, the only true God, and him whom he has sent. So, from the context of God, life and the meaning of existence begins when you know God by experience. This is not what your pastor says. This is not what somebody said about God. You can know about God, but you may not know God. In the Greek, the word is epignosis. It means to have a kind of knowledge of, just the way a man has a kind of knowledge of his wife. You know, you can know about a woman. You can talk about a woman, but there's no way you can know her like a husband. Because her husband has intercourse. That experiential knowledge is what God has in mind. But a lot of believers only know about God. And so you hear people talking and in 10 minutes they've quoted either their pastors or their men of God over a thousand times. There's nothing wrong with referencing those that are authorities over you. But if everything you know about God is something somebody has told you, you have a problem. You don't really know God. And you won't understand the impact until the day of trouble. He said, if you faint in the day of adversary, it means your strength is small. And Daniel said, they who do know their God, they are the ones who will be strong and do exploit. So the meaning of life is predicated upon your experiential knowledge of God. And the extent to which you can impact your generation is the degree to which you know God experientially. So one of the things God has asked me to do is to raise the people through my own dealings, through my own experiences with God, through the teachings and the trainings I have received over the years to equip a people that don't only come to the Lord to receive from Him, but people that know Him by experience. And secondly, is to raise a people that will walk in the fullness of their eternal ordination. That means when you come to church, people are not just clothed. When you go to the market, people are not just, you know, regulated by the energy of the environment. You get to Babylon, you can become a Babylonian. Not because you are born there, because the environment can condition you. You can be in Egypt and become an Egyptian because of the impact of the environment. 
But the man walking in the fullness of his ordination is not regulated by his territory because he knows he's an ambassador sent to that territory. So God is calling us again to raise a people that will not walk as clones because they are in a system. To raise a people that will not walk as, you know, puppets that have been regulated by the environment. This is not in any way to sound derogatory, but I assure you that the burden in the heart of God is to find people that are living life because that was what was written concerning them. He said, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. I ordained you to be prophet. There is an ordination for every man. And part of the things the Lord has prepared us for is to help people to come into the fullness of their eternal ordination. This is what we are here to do. And by the grace of God and the instrumentality of the Holy Spirit, this will be achieved. Wow, wow, wow. That's that's deep. That's deep. <clears throat> that's deep. And um, in in few words, this literally captures the essence of life. It is that is that is that an individual is able to come to the point where they are able to understand really what is the essence of life. Wow. Um, can you throw some light into the vision, the vision, the vision of okay. this ministry? Thank you very much. That's a very interesting question. Um, the vision of the ministry is threefold. Um, number one is to raise sons. Sons that understand the will of their father and give expression to it as they are living and life. Number two is to raise priests that carry the burdens of God and journey the path of intimacy. And number three is to raise kings that have the power to advance God's kingdom and purpose on the face of the earth and in doing that, reign in life. Now, what is the implication of this trapatide vision? In Ephesians chapter 4 from verse 11, the Bible said to some, he gave to be apostles, to some he gave to be prophets, to some he gave to be evangelists, to some he gave to be pastors and teachers. And then he now told us the purpose of the fivefold. He said, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, to prepare the saints for the work of the ministry. That's what we come to do, to perfect the saints. Now, the goal is not just the work itself. The idea is what the work make us become. So he goes further in verse 13 to say, Until we all come to the unity of the faith, unto the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the fullness of the stature of the measure of Christ. So that's fourfold. Number one, to the unity of the faith. Number two, knowledge of the Son of God. Number three, to a perfect man as a mature believer. And number four, to the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. What does it mean to walk in the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ? Is to find out who Christ is in, the, in his full excellency as a man. The only, there are three words in scriptures that define the fullness of the person of Christ. Number one is as a son. Number two is as a priest. And number three is as a prophet. If you study the scripture, you'll discover these three offices are not gifts. These three offices are dimensions available to every believer. Some can be apostles, some can be prophets, some can be evangelists, some can be pastors, some can be teachers. But whether an apostle or a believer, there is a destination for everyone is to come into the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. And that destination from scripture are the other dimension that Christ manifested, which is sonship, priesthood, and kingship. Now, what does sonship mean? Sonship is not just being born again. And that's why many times we advocate for people to grow beyond just being church members. Now, the church is doing a great deal of work. I came from the church. I was discipled in the church, and a lot is happening in the church. But God is also raising an apostolic order today to complement the labor of the church, to focus more on these threefold realities that I've spoken of. So the journey of sonship begins, with, first of all, accepting Jesus as the Lord of your life. He says, as many as believed, John chapter 1 from verse 12, to them he gave the right to become the sons of God. Now, 
when you journey through that operation, you discover that the first thing that happened is that these people were first of all born. So in James chapter 1, verse 8, he said, Of his own free will begat he us that we should be a type of his first fruit. Now he begat us as his children. As his children. Now that we have been born as his children, he expects us to grow into maturity. Mm -hmm. If we don't grow into maturity, we will not walk in the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's where sonship comes in. And there are two operational modalities for making a son. Number one is to constantly behold him. He said, when you behold, you are changed. Second Corinthians 3 verse 18. He said, we all with unveiled faces, beholding as in a glass, the image of the Lord, we are changed into that image from glory to glory so the body that we carry as a vision is the ability to present the person of christ to the body until as many as behold him are changed into his image because sonship is bearing the image of the father number two is to be led of the spirit in romans 8 14 he said as many as are led by the spirit of god they are the sons of God, not as many as are born again. Unfortunately, there are many who are born again, but they don't sustain the image of God. As there are many who are born again, they are not led by the Spirit of God. They are led by pastors, they are led by prophets, they are led by their biological father. And there's nothing wrong with that. There are many people I mentor today. But in addition to pastoral oversight, every one of us must behold Christ because he's been made bare. And every one of us must be led by the Holy Spirit. Paul was speaking in Galatians chapter 3 from verse 1. And he said, Oh, ye foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before whom Christ was made manifest, crucified amongst you. So the summary of Paul's ministry was to unveil Jesus so that they don't see Paul, they see Christ. Number two is priesthood. When you study the scripture, you discover the body in the heart of God is to raise priests. Not just Christians, not believers, but priests. In Exodus chapter 19 verse 4, he said, see how I delivered you from Egypt by a mighty hand, and I carried you up on eagles' wings. He said, if you will hearken to my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a kingdom of priests, a peculiar people unto me. This was what Peter reiterated in 1 Peter 2 verse 9. He said, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. In Revelation 1 verse 6, the Bible said concerning Jesus, that he has washed us and made us kings and priests. So there is a priesthood ordination for every believer who as such every believer must be mentored and taught what priesthood is about and made to understand that this is priority in the eyes of god because you can come to god for what he gives in fact there are three categories of interaction with god the first category is to come to him for what he gives that's the realm of a child and that's where you meet the multitude when jesus multiplied bread there were five thousand people but when Jesus went to Gethsemane, there were three people. What is the journey between 5,000 and three? It's a journey between a child to, the, to a son. It's a journey from a Christian to a believer, a martyr and a witness. You see that when you are giving what God has to offer, there will be crowd. And that's beautiful. All of us need what God offers. But beyond it, you have to come a bit deeper and give the principles of the kingdom. So people are not just coming to take healing. People are not just coming to take prophecy. They want to understand the ways of God. The Bible says Moses knew the ways of God. The children of Israel saw the acts of God. So when we teach people principles, doctrines, and precepts, they come to a, level, a higher level of maturity. But much more than that, they are the people that will teach the journey of intimacy, who seek God for himself. He said, draw us and we will run after you. He said, quicken us that we may call upon your name. These ones are not coming to God to receive what he has to offer alone. These ones are not coming to learn the principles of the kingdom and succeed. A Muslim can learn the principles of God and succeed. The richest men in the world today are not Christians. So there is somewhere beyond principle is the place of intimacy and that's the emphasis of priesthood. So we are interested as a people and as a corporate vision to raise a people that don't just have faith to receive from God, to raise a people that don't just understand the principles of the kingdom and apply it to succeed, but to raise the people that have a walk with God. And like Enoch, it will be said that these ones walked with God and were not. Not just because they are carried from the earth, but because their humanity is dominated by his divinity. 
You don't see them anymore. You know no man after the flesh. You see Christ in them. That's priesthood. Intimacy. Ministering to the Lord and walking with the Lord in intimacy. And then number three is kingship. Kingship is primarily understanding how to use the dominion, the authority and the power we have in God to advance his purposes on the face of the earth. And for that to be achieved, we must be taught and we must be trained. This is what it means to reign in life. There are many believers today who are begging because they have been mentored to live in fear. They have been mentored into mediocrity. So people come to church confident. But after being in church for five years, for ten years, they become mediocre. People come to church trusting God to do great things. After a while, they become mediocre. People give their hearts to Christ, believing that on that day, they will be able to raise the dead. On that day, God will prosper them. Look at them five years later. They literally sink because we have not mentored people in the order of kingship to let them know that it's not just about one man. Every one of us have our joint heirs with Christ and should manifest the glory of God. For that to happen, people must be given platforms. People must be given experience. People must be allowed to put the grace of God to work. People must be allowed to walk in faith, not just gather people in one place where we are just worshipping the Lord. No, after we worship the Lord, there are responsibilities that we must engage. It says strong need belong to them who are of age, who by reason of use. There are many believers who are not using the anointing, who are not using their faith, who are not using the grace of God, who are not using the wisdom of God, who are not using the charismas that God has put upon them. Because they think when you do this, you are either ambitious or you are carnal. Why do you think there are no apostles in the political sector? Because many people were discouraged. They thought politics was evil. But we need people, apostles, in the political corridor. That's kingship. Who can dominate that sphere? Why do you think there are not too many apostles in the economic world? Because they were discouraged. They think it's mammon. There's a difference between prospering for the kingdom and prospering for your belly. Kingship is dominating the world because you are God's battle act and there is an extension that you need to bring to the body of Christ. This is the vision of the ministry. To raise sons who bear the image of their God and are led by the Spirit. To raise priests that have a work of intimacy with the Lord and minister unto Him. And to raise kings with authority to advance God's kingdom and who will enjoy the abundance of life that God has given to us. There is no law that says you shouldn't live well on earth because you want to go to heaven. The Bible said they that receive of the gift of righteousness in Romans 5, 17 should reign in life. Should reign in life. We must reign in this earth before we reign with Christ in heaven. That is kingship. And that's the vision of Encounter Jesus Ministries International. Wow, wow, wow. This is this is this is deep. This is deep. And the reason why this is so important um is the the wisdom and the balance it brings. The balance, the balance, the three-foot balance. So as a son, as a priest, and as a king, because the challenge is certain people in the body of Christ have elapsed. So they are either um, on one end, so they are starting on one leg. They are either, they have learned the principles of sonship mm. and they're just there. They just think this is all. And then um, what you now find that that transcends people into religion is people who stay with priesthood. They're yes. just priesthood. And then yes, yes. it now builds onto religion you know, like you rightly explained. Um, In but fact, there are three key words that will determine our operations. The first is intimacy. The second is transformation. And the third is dominion. So yeah. everywhere you see Encounter Jesus Ministry, you have intimacy, transformation, and dominion. Intimacy is representative of priesthood. Transformation is representative of sonship. Mm-hmm. Dominion is representative of kingship. When these three balance comes together, you see a mature believer. Mm-hmm. Like you rightly said, there are certain people that say it's prayer, prayer, prayer. Walk with God, walk with God, until they become utterly useless. That's not God's plan. If God is only interested in we walking with Him, He would have taken all of us to heaven. He sent us to the earth to dominate the earth on His behalf. So there has to be a balance. In priesthood, there's a walk with God, and then legislation from that walk. In sonship, there's progressive transformation, because it's not just prayer and the word. The prayer and the word must reflect the character of God's spirit because you are adopting his image. And then there must be dominion. There must be dominion. It's not everybody that is set on fire today that is an apostle on the altar or a prophet. There are some people who will be on fire that will be senators. There are some people who will be on fire that will be merchants. You know, breaking and sealing deals in billions. 
because there is an agenda that must be advanced. Because if we don't do this, we can't man the gates. We can't man the gates. And I can't even begin to talk about that now. Wow, 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 wow. Short, the subject of um the subject of manning the gates that brings us to the next major thing the corporate objective so it's 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 that is not an individual um agenda or mandate it's yes. not just one person driving this you know so what you find in the um in in, in certain cases is where you have um, a one-man show yes. it's a one man it's it's moses ministry it's you know but then you you kept laying emphasis on the fact that this is it's okay so if i'm to touch priesthood it's like you're saying it's the priesthood of all believers when you when you're touching the subject of of of, of kinship it's all believers so yes. talk to us about the corporate objective of this thank you very much that's a very interesting question let me begin by first of all appreciating the fathers the ministers and the ministries in the body of christ like i said i'm a product of the body of Christ. I've been trained by at least three ministries. We have spent a good number of years, talking six, seven years. So I have been raised by the body of Christ. I'm a product of the church. I'm the product of pastors, prophets, apostles, evangelists, and teachers. I'm a product of elders. Elders who may not even be ordained into the fivefold have counseled me from place to place, advised me and corrected me. I'm a product of my own biological parents as well. My mom was an intercessor. She taught me the way of the Lord primarily. Now, what we are trying to do is not to negate what is already ongoing or to undermine the efficacy and the extent of what is already on ground. And what we are also trying to do is not to assume in any disposition of pride that we are the hope that the body of Christ is waiting for, that we are the standard, we are the acute. No, we are just coming to complement labors that are already on ground. And this is the angle the Lord wants us to come in from, right? Now, having said that, um, I want to now state the corporate objective, which is like the strategies that God has given to us to achieve in this. They are basically fourfold. The first is to create a platform, a platform for encountering Jesus. Because like I said, from the teachings of Paul in Galatians chapter 3, Paul made it make us understand that all he did was to paint Jesus and to paint him crucified. So if a ministry, a person, or a system is able to present Christ to a generation, that generation must, one, experience God, and number two, step into the fullness of their ordination. When you find a generation that is not experiencing God, walking with God by experience, and you find a generation that is confused as touching matters of ordination, they must see Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 2 from verse 1, it said, Brethren, when I came unto you, I did not come with excellency of speech, declaring the testimonies of God. He said, I choose to know nothing among you, save Christ and Him crucified. So we are, as a people, and as a strategy given to us by the Holy Spirit, and by the instrumentality of grace, create a platform where men would encounter Jesus. As such, furnishing an experiential knowledge of God in them. So if it's worship, the emphasis is to present Christ. There will be excellence, there will be skill, but our goal is not skill and excellence. Primarily, our goal is that Christ can be seen through the worship. If the world is going on, our goal is to see that Christ is painted out. And that's why I told my people when I was training them. I said, look here, we are not here to attack anybody. We are not here to serve as a corrective measure to anybody. We will preach the truth. If the truth corrects you, that's fine. If the truth reproves you, that's fine. If the truth instructs you, that's fine. If the truth empowers you, that's fine. The Bible said all scriptures, 1 Timothy 3.16, are given for reproof, for correction, for doctrine, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be equipped, thoroughly furnished unto every good works. So we are not coming to isolate ministries and say this is wrong, this is wrong, or to kick people out. We are just coming to present Christ. If Jesus is made manifest, the fornicator will see it. He will take dressing. The liar will take dressing. 
the exaggerator will take dressing because Jesus is the solution of the world. We will present him in spirit and in truth. What does that mean? The life of God will be communicated as we teach and as we worship. It's not just the head knowledge thing. It's an outpouring of a work of intimacy. The energy, the life, the power, the anointing of God will always be on display. The presence of God will be there. And through doctrine and sound teaching of the word, Jesus will be presented. That's our first strategy. So, Encounter Jesus Ministries is a platform for making Jesus visible to a generation. Number two, we are going to bring them into the fullness of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the animator of the possibilities of God so that they can enjoy the fullness of his ministry. Number three, we are going to bring sound teaching of the word. And I'm talking doctrine now. Because when you are presenting Jesus, sometimes you can present him prophetically and by inspiration. But there's also a place where people are trained through doctrine. That's the apostolic ministry to build. So there will be a place of actual exegesis of scriptures and building of people so that the Christ that they've encountered in the spirit, they can mirror his life through principles in their daily living. And then number four, we are going to advocate for the unity of the body of Christ. We will stand for love and the mystery of oneness. By so doing, we we'll honor every grace, we we'll honor everyone that the Lord affirms to our spirit that are walking in the direction of the spirit. We will honor the fathers, we will acknowledge the labors of everyone, and we will relate to the body of Christ from the place of love. That's a place of truth, a place of tolerance, a place of oneness, a place of, you know, all that love entails. As touching the scripture, we will mirror love as our mode of operation. And finally, we will keep our gaze on raising sons, prophets, and kings. That's the strategy. Wow. That's a corporate objective. Wow, wow, wow. Wow, wow. Well, this is this is this is this is awesome. So we have been able to achieve one thing in this session. Um the man and the message. And um, we want to say a very big thank you for affording us this opportunity, especially considering um, um your very demanding schedule. And we trust that um subsequently we'd have other time to explore um other questions that probably would bring for clarity you know, to avoid assumptions um, um in subjects as this concerning the ministry thank you so much sir and god bless you thank god you bless you god bless you god bless you, you. Thank you sir.